town of Fort Bragg, and also be seen all over the world because we are streaming live on the Internet right now. And that's really exciting. First time ever we've done that. Now I have the honor of presenting Dr. Thomas Lodi. Thomas Lodi, MD, a master level psychologist, received his medical degree in 1985 from the University of Hawaii. He completed his internship and residency in internal medicine at Columbia University and worked for 10 years as an internist, urgent care physician, and in intensivist, that's kind of hard for me to say, ICU and CCU. After several years of additional training in alternative modalities, he narrowed his focus to integrative oncology. He is a member of ASCO, a diplomat of the American Board of Anti-Aging Medicine, an instructor and practitioner in insulin potentiation therapy, and he is, a, he is certified in oxidative and chelation therapies. Dr. Lodi is a licensed medical doctor in the state of New York and homeopathic medical doctor in the state of Arizona. At his practice, an oasis of healing in Mesa, Arizona, the foundation of the therapies is restoring the integrity of the immune system and organ function through detoxification and proper nutrition. Wow, this is an expert. This man knows what he's talking about and has a lot to share. Please help me welcome Dr. Thomas Lodi. Thank you. Um, how many people were here or heard, heard the talk on Friday? Okay, about half. All right, because there was there's some there were some uh, uh, some important concepts that I'll, I'll try to review. But today I was going to talk about disease. Oh, another question: How many people either have cancer, had cancer, or no? people with cancer. <laughs> one out of two men will get cancer in their lifetime and one out of 2.8 women will get cancer in their lifetime in this country and Europe, Asia. The World Health Organization recently announced, you might have recalled, um, that by 2010 the leading cause of death worldwide will be cancer. So this is the real pandemic. The other one we're hearing about is really a planned -demic. That's the influenza, you know, where the swine and the uh, chickens mated. You understand how that works, right? <laughs> you believe that, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, I want to talk about disease. And uh, what do we have to talk about if we're going to talk about disease? First thing we need to talk about is health. What is health? And uh, if you ask most practitioners and most people, they'll define health as the absence of disease. And that's like saying that light is the absence of darkness. How much darkness do you take out of a room to find the light? It's an absurd concept. Okay, so the truth is, is that um, <clears throat> disease, uh, health is not the absence of anything, it's the presence of something. And it's the presence of the ability to regenerate, rejuvenate, and procreate. Okay, and and to do that exuberantly. And this happens because the the imperative of nature is to regenerate, rejuvenate, and procreate. It's it's, it's a very important concept to understand. If you were to uh, slice your arm by mistake, cutting a coconut open, it would heal. That's what nature does. Nature heals and it overcomes. Water rolling down a hill, if you put a rock there, it's going to go around it. You've got to put a pretty big dam up to stop it. Okay, so nature uh, is irresistibly drawn to heal, to grow, to procreate. Okay, that's the natural state of things. Okay, what is nature? Nature is a perfect... I don't know what to call it, but it's perfect. If a bear has a bowel movement, it turns out to be or, um, uh, nourishment for other organisms. There's no waste in nature. And nature can be seen as a um, 
having billions and billions of faces, of eyes. It's got the eyes of a butterfly and it's got the eyes of a bear, the eyes of a human. That's what nature is. And every set of eyes, every aspect of nature, must function optimally in order for this whole to be perfect. And it is perfect. And so this optimal functioning of every aspect of nature is what we would call health. So the optimal functioning of an organism is its health. And that's what health is. Okay. <clears throat> optimal functioning is allowed and is permitted through a mechanism known as instinct. Instinct is how we are plugged into the wisdom of nature. Unfortunately, <clears throat> humans are a disallowed instinct. Our parents tell us early on that it's not acceptable to be instinctual. Don't put that in your mouth, don't touch that, don't... And uh, pretty soon we find ourselves um, completely cut off from nature, living in boxes and driving around in machines, living artificial lives. Now, when we talk about optimal functioning of an organism, it can only be understood in the context of its environment. If you were to describe the life cycle of a bird, you would have to include worms. In the life cycle of a worm, you'd have to include birds. How would you describe walking if you don't if you don't describe the street upon which you're walking or the path upon which you're walking. If you don't have that, you'd have just two legs dangling. Okay, so we have to understand. Unfortunately, uh, our Western education and our Western ignorance has taught us to distinguish things and to not see the whole, not see the yin-yang there. Okay, so we see um, uh, the bird flying. And we think the bird's flying. You know, the, as the bird decided to get up and fly. Right? And all the birds in the flock decide immediately to turn right and they quick communication. Okay, none of that's happening. What's really happening is li life happens. <clears throat> birds fly, not because they decided to, because it's their destiny to fly. This environment that we're talking about is the niche. In biology, it's called a niche. Niche, niche. And each organism is part of that niche. So the, the worm is part of the bird's niche, and the bird is part of the worm's niche. Okay? And when removed from that niche, there can no longer be optimal functioning. And that's... <clears throat> So consider this, consider a, 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 a sea bass taken out of, taken out of the salt water at sea and put into a freshwater lake. There's going to be a problem. You take an eagle off the cliffs and you put it into a cave with bats, it's going to be a problem. Okay. What does our niche and what does our optimal functioning look like? Well, our niche is probably not probably, our niche is between the tropics of uh, Capricorn and Cancer. We live, at, we're from the subtropics, that's where we function. That's our niche. Okay, where there is abundant vegetation and water and warm sunshine. And survival is not an eight hour a day uh, requirement. Survival is something that takes one to two hours. And there's a lot of leisure and love, swimming, laughing, music. That's our niche. As we, were, as we left that niche and we moved <clears throat> north and south of those lines, we got into uh, environments which were not appropriate for us and so we adapted. And so now we'll find Eskimos drinking blubber and we'll find uh, cultures where they're uh, eating live monkey brain. This enculturation process, which has caused us 
to ignore our instincts. Um, if you think about any culture, whether it's Chinese or Italian or German, what is the centerpiece of every culture? What holds it together? What is the altar of that culture that everyone gathers around daily? The cuisine, the dinner table. Okay. Right? Would you go to Italy and not eat pizza or pasta? You know. If you did, you'd probably be suffering the whole time that you didn't eat it. Okay. There you go. Optimal functioning of a human being. We have no clue. We know what it is for butterflies and bears and birds. We have no clue for humans. We do know that Einstein used about 9% of his potential. We know that <clears throat> there are uh, people in uh, uh, Machu Picchu who are fathering children anywhere from the ages of 90 and up. We know that um, Victorus, if, you, if everyone's read his book, you recall in one of the chapters about that man from China who was congratulated on his 150th birthday by the Chinese government and then, he, and then on his 200th birthday and then he was thought to have died around the age of 256, around there. And this was in the 1930s, before we had too much propaganda going on. Um, anyway, the point is we have no idea what our potential is. And if you look at the patriarchs in the Old Testament, um, average of 912 years before the flood. Okay. So the point is we don't know what our potential is, but it's certainly not uh, shriveling up at the age of 90 and falling over. We were probably designed to live about a millennium. Okay. Now, we said that health is not the absence of disease, it's the opposite. Disease is the absence of health, just as darkness is the absence of light. What causes the darkness? The shadows. There are shadows. All right? Um, absence of light. Shadows block them. So you can have a very sunny day and the clouds are there. You start to get shadows. It gets darker and darker. Okay. So um, these shadows are cast by obstructions. And keep in mind, it's very important, shadows are not real. Just ask Peter Pan. He had it sewn onto his foot, if you all recall. Anyway, what are these shadows when it comes to health or lack of it? These are cultural behaviors that we learn. So we learn to do certain things, and those, those become the obstructions to health and the cast shadows, which we call disease. I'm going to review... Disease. I'm going to right now quote <clears throat> uh, an MD, another MD, um, who I have a lot of respect for. In the mo in, under most circumstances, I have um, very little respect for MDs. Not because, you know, what, all the good stuff we can say about them, but a bit because of what they do and that they don't do. Most MDs ignore the truth uh, to, the, to the detriment of their patients. And I remember taking a Hippocratic Oath, and I can't, I, I can't imagine not, not living up to that oath. And that, you know, first of all, do no harm. 85% of oncologists, when um, uh, surveyed anonymously, would not do their own treatments. And they bring their wives to people like me and their husbands. Okay, so we're, we're beyond negligence. We're into evil. Okay, so... Anyway, but John Tilden, 1840, in the 1840s he was born, he died in, 1850s he was born and died in 1940. Okay. He wrote a book called Toxemia Explained. Everyone should read it if you haven't. Incredible book. Um, but, here's a quote by him. There is no hope that medical science will ever be a science. For the whole structure is built around the idea that there is an object disease that can be cured when the right drug, remedy, cure is found. 
And I'd like to read you part of his preface, and it's very important, so please listen. Part of his preface to the book, Toxemia Explained. From time immemorial, man has looked for a savior. And when not looking for a savior, he is looking for a cure. He believes in paternalism. He is looking to get something for nothing, not knowing that the highest price we ever pay for anything is to have it given to us. Instead of accepting salvation, it is better to deserve it. And instead of buying, begging, or stealing a cure, it is better to stop building disease. Diseases of man's own building, and one worse thing than the stupidity of buying a cure, is to remain so ignorant as to believe in cures. The false, the false theories of salvation and cures have built man into a mental mendicant when he could be the arbiter of his own salvation and certainly his own doctor. Instead of being a slave to a profession that has neither worked out its own salvation from disease nor discovered a single cure in all the age-long period of man's existence on earth. So, what now we're going to get into some of the <clears throat> details of what disease is. As our body metabolizes, metaboli metabolization is, metabolism means uh, it's, it's, it's made of two parts, anabolic, anabolism, and catabolism. So building up and tearing down. Okay, and that's the ebb and the flow. If you look out the ocean there, it ebbs and flows. And all life is ebbing and flowing. Okay, so <clears throat> um, cells are built and they're torn down. And it's all done uh, perfectly. The parts that are torn down and recycled which are called can be called metabolic wastes. Okay, those are normally taken care of by physiological processes such as urinating, defecating, sweating, and even vomiting. Okay, this is a physiological mechanism of, of excreting <clears throat> these metabolic wastes and also some other wastes. In addition to metabolic wastes, there are environmental toxins. We and we I don't have to get into that here, but you all know that we live in a, a sea of toxins, right? From the carpeting to exhaust and everything in between. Electrum, now we have electromagnetic uh, poisons. So, um, and what is poison? Well, what is food? Food is something that can be assimilated by the body, by whatever species, whatever organism has ingested it, it's something, and can be used for nourishment, it can be used to build new tissue. Poison is that which cannot be used and must be expelled on a very, on a very subtle level. And, and, so, and these poisons are, <clears throat> um, can be mild to severe, as you well know. Okay, so the accumulation of... Uh, one other thing with food, would, it, con consuming something that you can use, would we consider oxygen a food? Will we consider water a food? Plants. Yeah. Okay. Now, one quick idea I want to just put in here because it's appropriate, and that is um, <clears throat> everything that we need, we need in the amount that we need, and we don't need any more. Okay, we need oxygen anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of the atmosphere. Okay, if you put a 100 percent oxygen mask on your mouth and your nose, <clears throat> within two weeks, you would have emphysema. You know, water is very important. You drink five, six gallons a day, and you won't live very long. Okay. Just keep that in mind. Um, of course, food is the same, or it's things that we ingest and chew and swallow. Okay, so the accumulation of toxins, whether they're from the environment or metabolic waste products, they, they start to accumulate, and then they spill into the blood. The suffix of the word that uh, is used to describe anything in the blood is emia. So if you have very low blood, it's anemia. Okay? If you have too much blood, it's hyperemia. Well, if you get toxins in the blood, it's called toxemia. And that's where the word comes from, toxemia. Spillage of toxins into the blood. And so what we call disease is our body's effort to get rid of this. Okay, and so now <clears throat> those efforts, depending on how you know, depending on how much toxins are 
being brought in and accumulating and and all that. Um, uh, and where, what part, what organ is working the hardest, and you know which organ starts to malfunction, we'll call it a disease. It's as if. Um, um, if you look at it as a trunk, the trunk of a tree is the toxemia, and all the branches are the manifestations, and that goes from headache to cancer. Okay. Now, uh, Tilden also, in his <clears throat> back in the, the uh, early 20th century and the late 19th century, um, talked about symptoms. Symptoms are usually called diagnoses. My diagnosis is you have a headache. All right. Well, well that's not a doesn't mean anything. Let's figure out where, what, what are we talking about with headache? Is it, is it due to pressure? Is it due to arterial spasm, as in migraines and dilatation? You know, what's it due to? So let's say we find out we, it's due to pressure. Is pressure the disease? Well, what's causing the pressure? And if you keep going, you know, now let, let's say the, um, uh, eventually it hemorrhages. Is hemorrhage the disease? Well, let's say you die. Is death the disease? You understand that the more you keep trying to figure out what it is behind it, you'll get down to only one thing. It's called toxemia. As uh, John Tilden says, when the cause of the pain is found, it too will be found to be a symptom and not a disease. And this will be true to the end. Okay. All the medical literature from the Journal of the American Medical Association, the New England Journal of Medicine, the um, uh, British Journal of Medicine, the Lancet, all these prestigious journals are all, talk, are all based on discussing that which is a fantasy. Because there's no disease and there's no cure, therefore no cure. You understand that medicine is based on the fact that every disease is separate distinct and therefore has a separate and distinct etiology or cause and by having a separate and distinct etiology and cause it therefore requires a separate and distinct cure and you got to come to me because I studied all these things and I know these things it's all it, none of it is true now I wanna, there's another group I, I'm, I'm trying to I want to try to give you a little little uh, tour here of some of the thinking. Uh, uh, homeopathy. There was a guy, um, one of the home homeopaths, um, came up with the concept of homotoxicology. It's very similar. I just want to briefly do it. So um, again, he says diseases are caused by toxins. Uh, and homotoxin, homo means toxins produced within um, chemicals, microorganisms, byproducts, post-traumatic cellular debris and byproducts of uh, hidden metabolic processes. Okay. What is the organism? And this is a really good concept. What is the organism? The organism is a flowing system of energy circulating. This energy circulates throughout the matrix. The matrix is the intercellular space. Every cell is surrounded by a space. Blood vessels don't go directly into a cell. They go into a area that's called it's, it's called the extracellular space okay the blood vessel goes in there the, the vein drains it out the nerves go in there the autonomic nervous system and it's this matrix this extracellular space that has to have a pH of 7.4 it's this matrix that has to have a certain oxygen concentration has to have a certain glucose load so it's really this matrix that is the bath around which cells have their existence okay this matrix is what is the, the meridians in Chinese medicine. Okay. What homotoxins are, according to this uh, view of it, is that homotoxins are, uh, they reduce the conductivity. Now remember, we talked about, uh, the other day we were talking about electrolytes and you know, sodium and potassium and all these things, which are positively charged elements that allow the conduction of electrons, and that is what we call electricity. And we, we were, we're reminded that uh, we determine if our heart's working by doing an EKG, and we look at the electrical output of our heart, and the shape of those waveforms tell us, tells us a lot. Okay? Flat lines are uh, usually to be avoided. And the same thing with... Uh, <laughs> 
The same thing with um, uh, brain waves, EEGs, EMGs. Okay, so electric, the, the detection of whether or not life is present is done by uh, measuring electrical output. Okay, and also the evaluation of how, of the quality of that life form. Okay, so, uh, anyway, so the, <clears throat> the um, homotoxicologist had it pretty good there. Okay. Um, I won't, because I'm running out of time, I won't go into all this. It's very important. But at the center of the matrix is a little cell called the fibroblast. And the fibroblasts, um, I mentioned the other day, too, that we no longer consider the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is as being the brains of the cell. Rather, it's the sex organ of the cell. The brains are the membranes. Easy to remember. Membranes are in touch with the environment, the matrix. Okay? So in the matrix is a little cell called the fibroblast. And what it does is it, it is sampling what's going on and producing the appropriate... Um, glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans and all these special types of cells or uh, cellular products that uh, maintain the conductivity because they're all negatively charged. Okay, so fibroblasts are pretty important little things. It's an example of what these proteoglycans are is like, for example, heparin. Heparin which lines blood vessels. Every time you get a cut, you get stabbed with a, you know, toothpick, and um, uh, you get a cut, not only are you starting to clot, but you've got all this heparin being produced to not clot. Okay, so in our body, it's, it's always working to balance. If you get too many clots, you get a stroke, you get a you know, kidney infarct. So. <clears throat> okay, so in, according to homotoxicology, the uh, the type and severity of an illness is determined by the duration and intensity of the toxin. And it's the, clog, the ultimate clogging of this matrix, the, block, the blocking of this matrix that results in cellular damage, organ damage, and disease. Okay, so I really like their view of things. And they actually have broken it down to six phases of disease. The excretion phase, the inflammation phase, the digestion phase, impregnation phase, degeneration phase, and the differentiation phase, the sixth phase of disease. I won't go into all of them because it would be another whole lecture, but the differentiation phase is important because this is where malignant disease arises. Malignant disease is just the end of, of, a, of, a, of a sequence. I can't tell you how many patients have sat in front of me and said, you know, I'm really healthy except for the cancer. <laughs> and, and it's true. They, they believe it, they mean it, and it's, you know, it's true. Why? Because we don't know what health is. If you want to get an idea of health, go to a nursery school. Pew, bouncing off the walls, doing somersaults, that's health. That's health. What's the difference between an old man and a young man besides the, the shape of the body and all that? Energy. Let's look at the energy. Okay? Remember, energy. He was talking about energy in the matrix. Energy. Why do we eat? We eat to get energy. That energy comes from the sun, through the plants, to the animals. How much energy can you get from eating a corpse? <laughs> you know, you know uh, if you're a maggot, you'll probably do pretty well. <laughs> It's unbelievable, but there are still people, I'm sure, in this audience, too, that dine on corpses. It's amazing. Um, you know, if we, if we make it past 212, I'm sure there will be a time in the future where people will look back and say, can you imagine they used to eat corpses? It's like, you know, if you look up the word ghoul, G-H-O-U-L, that's what a ghoul does. They devour corpses. But it tastes good. I feel better. You know, I feel better when I shoot a spoon of heroin. I feel better when I smoke a fat cigar. If it, feel good, if it feels good, do it, right? <clears throat> okay. Um, the fundam... What? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Wow. There's no way. 
And the earliest, okay, I, you know, I, inflammation is also what we refer to uh, as the fundamental, the fundamental pathology in disease. Inflammation basically is, uh, it goes way back to the Romans. And the, actually the Egyptians are the first ones to describe it, and then the Romans did. And the Romans gave us pretty much the cardinal signs of inflammation, calor, dolor, tumor, and rubor. Calor is heat, dolor is pain, rubor is redness, and tumor is in, getting bigger. Okay? So tumor, tumor is just something that's larger. Okay? It can be benign, like that, like a blister, or malignant. Okay, so, um, but anyway, it all has to do with increasing the blood flow, making the blood vessels more permeable so that the tissues get uh, uh, bathed with um, uh, the, immu the immune system shows up. Okay, and the immune system is white blood cells, red, you know, macrophages and a whole variety of, of cells. Uh, and they start producing what are called cytokines and interleukins, uh, leukotrienes, and with these, with these chemicals do is they are communicating to the rest of the body what's going on here, all that. And they do that by going into the lymph, lymphatics. They send it to the blood and then they go into the lymphatics and they get up to a lymph node and that's where they really, you know, do a lot of work. And um, so run when the surgeon tells you he wants to remove your lymph nodes because we found a lump in your lymph node. Okay? That lump means your lymph nodes are doing what they were designed to do. Okay? Should we do lymphatic massage on someone with breast cancer? Yeah. Well, no, no. Make it stagnant. Don't let it move. What happens if it's stagnant? What happens if water gets stagnant? Are you going to drink out of it? No. Okay. Anyway, our modern understanding of inflammation is much, much more complex. And it's, you know, you got to have a, a PhD in biochemistry to understand it. So the word we put on, the, the suffix that we put on the end of words is called itis, I-T-I-S. Bronchitis, iritis, rhinitis, dermatitis. What does it mean? It means inflammation. So inflammation is the body's first attempt to, if you can't excrete it from your urine, if you can't defecate it, can't sweat it, your, your body will next do, do inflammation. And what they're finding out now is that inflammation, uh, which occurs and then is resolves, occurs and resolves, right? You acute inflammation, you get hit there and it goes away. Okay. Again, the ebb and flow, you know, the rhythm of nature, the rhythm of life. Okay. Um, when something happens and that inflammation becomes chronic, it's that chronic inflammation that underlies the development of pathological physiology, pathological biochemistry. Okay. Um, there's so much to talk about. The, you know, the, uh, when we talk about lipids, lipids are fats. Uh, our bodies produce um, arachidonic acid and eicosanoids which are the omega-3, uh, omega-6 and omega-3s, okay? They're both necessary. We need that little bit of arachidonic acid to do, to, to do the pro-inflammatory job. And we need the eicosanoids to do the anti-inflammatory job, okay? That's the yin-yang, like estrogen and progesterone, right? A lot of women are walking around with lumps in their breasts, not because of anything other than there is an out, uh, not, a, not a balance of estrogen and progesterone. Yin-yang. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, arachidonic acid, too much arachidonic acid gets sequestered because it is an absolute poison. It causes total body in inflammation. And... Um, um, it's found in animals. Animals have arachidonic acid. Okay. So every time you eat a corpse, or, and when they die, there's a lot of inflammation going on. Too. Every time you eat a corpse, you're, get, you're eating a lot of arachidonic acid. Um, 
Anyway, one of the ways in which we measure inflammation, how do we measure inflammation? Because was it was in 2002, I think Life Magazine or Time Magazine had on their cover, we found the test. There's one test that is more important than your cholesterol. It's called CRP, C-reactive protein. Okay, C-reactive protein was discovered back in the 30s. And um, uh, basically, it's produced by the liver. The liver produces... Um, uh, uh, a CRP, and it's not just a measure. It's not just there for us to measure. I mean, you know, nature didn't pr produce CRP for us to measure and define, and to be able to be able to evaluate inflammation. But it actually, has a purpose. It does certain things. It, it actually uh, allows the phagocytosis by immune cells of other cells. Phagocytosis. Uh, phago means eat, right? Cyto means cell. Okay. Um, so what does, uh, what's that word again? Necrophagia mean? Eating of dead tissues. Cheeseburger, steak, pork chops, mm. sushi, mm. give me some dead tissue. Okay. Anyway, CRP is part of the acute phase reactants that are produced by the liver, they have a purpose. So we now know that if we, it, it rises the fastest within the first six hours, so we can look at CRP levels, so, because they found out, the cardiologists, do you remember all the stuff about Lipitor and, and car, cardiac disease, and got to lower the cholesterol, right? My cholesterol's, right? Well, it turns out that half the people having heart attacks have normal cholesterols. So what does it mean? Nothing, cholesterol. What they were finding is that their CRP was up. Okay, C-reactive protein. And it was more predictive. They did a study with 28,000 women looking at their CRP levels and found them to be more predictive of anything, post-surgically, in all, in all different areas. Okay? So looking at the inflammatory state of the body is more important. There's another way, Dr. Barry Sears, who with the zone diet, you know, again, another, you know. You don't, you, when someone's giving you a lecture or discussion, look at them. Look at their body. Look at Andrew Weil's body and then tell me what you're going to believe about nutrition. I mean, he might know a lot. He's from Harvard, you know, like, whoa. So, <laughs> hey, so he might know a lot of stuff, but he certainly does not eat. And if he does, he doesn't practice it. So you have to really just look at the person that's talking to you. But anyway, Barry Sears, brilliant guy, found out, uh, talks, has, has brought to, the, to everyone the concept of silent inflammation as being the cause of all disease. This is great, because now what's happened is modern science is coming back to what the ancients have always known. It's beautiful. It's kind of like Fritjof Kopra wrote a book called The Tao of Physics, right? He found out that phys physicists now know what the ancients knew. <laughs> it's fantastic. You know, we have to come back to it. As Solomon said, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. It's just not, it's absolutely true. Anyway, so CRP, so what Barry Sears found out is that you look at the arachidonic acid to the uh, EPA ratio, okay? Icosopentanoic acid, EPA and arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is going to cause pro-inflammation, and this is going to cause anti-inflammation. And it's that ratio. If that ratio is around 1, you're in absolute perfect health, 1.5. That's great. Up to 3, you, you're okay, and then... So we look at most Americans, they're 12. Okay. Um, anyway, we found out that it's related to every disease. Okay. So what should we do? Let's reduce inflammation. Now, and what's the ultimate inflammatory disease? Aging. Okay. Um, what... I want to get to here is, finally, there is a guy named, oh, uh, real quickly on fat, obesity, okay? Uh, it, they, were, they, were, they did a, uh, an amazing, I don't know how these people sleep at night, but they did an amazing study where they took uh, obese men, went in and did surgery on them, and removed the visceral fat, the fat around the organs, not around the belly. And uh, these are all, they're all diabetic, because when you get to that weight, you're diabetic. Uh, diabetic is an eating disorder, remember that. Diabetes, type 2. Anyway, that visceral fat 
is what is causing the diabetes. Their diabetes went away by getting rid of that. Okay. Now, the visceral fat, remember, what does it do? Fat has, it's adipocytes and it's got macrophages, macrophages, white blood cells in there. Both of them produce IL-6, interleukin-6. And if you know anything about the anatomy there, you'll remember that all the organs drain through the portal vein into the liver. So you've got these high levels of IL-6 going to the liver. The liver's pumping out C-reactive protein. So it's the visceral fat. So the first thing you want to do to get healthy is um, fast cleanse. Wow. What a concept. <laughs> there are botanical things that we can use. Uh, but, but again, you know, going to botanical medicine, again, is... That's why uh, uh, most naturopaths are not natural. They're allopaths in, in green coat instead of a white coat. <laughs> hey, I got this bag of... Boswellia for you, or, you know, quercetin, quercetin. The truth is, nature fixes itself. That's what it does. Remove the impediments and it will heal. It has to heal. It has no choice. Okay, ginger, turmeric, all these things. You can use those and then go eat a cheeseburger. Oh, wow. I'm coming to it now. I, I, I only got two minutes. Okay. What, what's the correlation of disease to the mind? Okay, this was, it was way too long of a lecture. I can't do it. So what I'll do is I'll go to that. Um, basically, okay. Anyway, as a real quick aside, Luigi Fontana f did uh, some work uh, at Washington University where he looked at raw foodists and he looked at uh, regular eaters. And when he looked at all the different parameters that he looked at, he found out that their bones were thinner. However, they did not have osteoporosis, and they were strong. He also looked at the fact that all of them had lower CRP levels. Imagine that, eating raw food. This, goes, this correlates with what we found out in the 30s when they did a blood test on people and found out the white blood cells were elevated with cooked food and were normal. Okay, I know, I know, I know. I know. So anyway... Uh, that's Luigi Fontana. He's done some great work, and he's found the same thing happens in caloric restriction, caloric restriction and, the, uh, and eating raw foods. But what I want to hear, I, I, it's something that I've termed, it's called psychological inflammation. Okay? Psychological inflammation is what we call stress. All right? Now, what is stress? We put, you know, stress really, really impacts all diseases. Stress is really... It was, you know, Hans Selye was the guy that defined it initially, because stress used to be a physical thing, right? You stress on a muscle, stress on a... Okay. Stress is when you don't like what is. That's all it is. Your prediction of how it should be is not happening. <laughs> okay? Now, so that opposing of how it should be and how it is are opposing, we call that stress. Okay? And the inflammation of the mind. Okay. Um, okay. Now, um, which and and so, what is the? I won't go into details. I just wanted to at least answer your question. But that's how it is. How do we de-stress? Well, how do you get healthy? What did we just mention a moment ago? You get healthy by fasting. Stop eating. Stop eating. Drink a lot. Rest. Clean your colon out, and you will heal. So, how do we really make the mind better? See, in the West, if you go to Western psychologists, which I had training in, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's just as insane as the medical world. We're, we're going to make a better we're going to make your mind more healthy. In the East, what I love about the East is they say, the mind is the problem. Transcend the mind and you're okay. It's not going to make a better working mind. Because the mind is based, the mind is an artificial place. It's, got, it's made of symbols and it's made of uh, pictures and words, neither of which are real. You know, the word chair and the picture of a chair is not a chair, right? And that's what the mind does. And the mind also deals in this artificial thing called time. I've never, ever been anywhere where it wasn't now. Ever. <laughs> is that, you know, so that's why I don't carry watches. They're irrelevant. They're made up. <clears throat> anyway, the point is the mind works in time, which isn't. 
and it works, and it, and it also, because we always think about what was, what could be, what should be, what might be, what could have been, what should have been, and what will be. None of it is. And what happens when we're there? We're unhappy. You're never happy when you're thinking about that stuff. When are you happy? You're happy when your mind is turned off. What are moments that allow us to turn our mind off? Orgasm comes to mind. You're not thinking at that moment. Music. Why do we love music? Music is now. Dancing, surfing. Okay. The minute we talk, the minute we think, we're disturbed. <laughs> so this whole thing comes down to two. Fasting and meditating. Meditation is not some religious thing. It's just a matter of turning off the mind and getting a method to do that. Okay, when you turn off the mind, you're, in the, you're, you're just aware. And that awareness, what are you aware of? Bliss, perfection. That's all that's going on. Okay, because remember, nature is perfect and the, and, the, and, the, um, and, the, and the creatures are connected to that nature. You know, do you think, just remember, dogs are not sitting around anticipating. <laughs> right? Or, or having remorse for what they barked about, you know. <laughs> and neither is a flock of birds when they're going, okay, we're coming up, turn right. <laughs> okay, so life is a happening. Okay, so the best thing to do about anything is nothing. Anyway, thank you. I'll close with that.